G'day and welcome to the second to last episode of ACT TV. We said we'd do it until Auckland is released from Alert Level 4, and that's happening at 11.59pm tomorrow night. So we've got tonight and tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, and then that's the end of ACT TV, hopefully forever, because we don't want any more lockdowns. People just can't afford them uh, for medical reasons, people accessing healthcare for education, kids learning and socialising, for small businesses that borrowed to get through the last lockdown and their banks have told them they can't borrow more to get through this one. We've got to end level four lockdowns. And it's a little bit sad because it will also be the end of ACT TV, but perhaps it'll be back sporadically as different issues crop up over time. And what a day we've had today. Parliament wasn't actually open in terms of the House having question time. That'll be tomorrow, and we're looking forward uh, to getting in and asking the government some hard questions there. But we did have quite a few events. Uh, first and foremost, some meddled NZD Defence Force uh, soldiers, actually Afghani translators, around 40 of them, who helped New Zealanders fighting in Afghanistan for over 10 years. And they are now here in New Zealand, but it's their families who are being targeted by the Taliban, having their houses searched and ransacked. They need to get their families out as soon as possible. And guess what? In classic New Zealand government fashion, they are languishing in the immigration queue. Now, we've got huge problems with immigration processing time, and it's one of the issues that comes up for members of parliament more than anything else. But the people that are in all sorts of difficult situations waiting for their visas to be processed usually aren't having their houses ransacked by a group of evil religious fundamentalist death cult worshippers in the form of the Taliban. These guys need their visas expedited so that their family members who are now being targeted for what they did to help the New Zealand Defence Force can get out of Afghanistan and get here and be safe. Not only are those visas being processed very slowly, but they only allow each translator to bring one family member. Well, hello, the Taliban doesn't just target one family member. They target whole families of people who help the New Zealand Defence Force. Now, we have an obligation if we are going to expect people in faraway lands to be friendly and helpful and in some cases save the lives of Kiwi soldiers in theatres of war, uh, then we need to make it clear that New Zealand will have your back. It won't leave you hanging out to dry. If we don't look after these people, it's going to affect the New Zealand Defence Force's ability to operate in the future. That's why we'll be asking questions in Parliament tomorrow about this. When will the Minister actually come out and meet these folk. They've said they're going to stay in Parliament all week until the Minister comes out and responds to them, and we're going to keep asking the government questions until they do. It's the right thing to do for those people, but also for the future of New Zealand. The other thing that happened is the government finally opened up its new lobby waiting room queuing system to get into MIQ. And as some people on the news said just an hour ago, it was disappointing, but not surprising. What they found is that there were 26,000 people trying to get a very small number of rooms available in MIQ. And it really summed up the fundamental problem that New Zealand faces. Not enough MIQ capacity for the number of people, and these are New Zealand citizens, remember, who want to get back into the country for a whole variety of personal and commercial reasons. The ACT Party says, now we know there's 26,000 people trying to get a couple of thousand rooms, we've got to expand capacity, either by having private MIQ with higher standards of the government than the government's like MIQ, where everybody's vaccinated, everyone's saliva tested every second day, and the private operators who might be mothballed hotel owners all up and down New Zealand lose their license to do this if they break the rules. We could allow thousands more people through the border, through private MIQ, if only the government had the political will and the ability to actually work with business and unite to, towards achieving a common cause, rather than what they seem to do, which is Dr. Ashley and the Ministry of Health always know best. 
Then we had an alert level change. The alert level change is welcome in Auckland, and it's also going to be the end for a while of Act TV. But it's incredible what the Prime Minister said. She said, we know that there's not transmission in the workplace. She said the transmission is mostly happening within households. And then she said there's transmission to, wait for it, secondary households. What that usually is called is community transmission from one household to the next. But nevertheless, what she admitted is that level four hasn't been working and level three will probably be just as effective because it allows more people to go to work and that's not where the transmission has been happening anyway, according to her. So the question is why we didn't allow level three a week ago or two weeks ago when ACT was calling for a transition measure to get out of level four lockdown and wait for vaccination to occur. You see, the problem is people are losing money hand over fist. And that's why it's the worst of all worlds. We've still got COVID spreading at just enough of a rate to say a level four hasn't eliminated it, but we're also decimating business for no apparent reason. So that's an extra week, arguably an extra two weeks, that the government has imposed this lockdown on New Zealanders and Auckland, and as a result, cost huge amounts of money by not having a plan. Act says that we need to be clear what the strategy is. Is it still elimination, or are we going to manage a form of suppression where we keep cases low enough to stop overcrowding the hospitals with upgraded testing, tracing, vaccination rates, new treatments, and better rules for the game of the game that allow people that can do business safely to do business safely? Just to give one example, what about butchers that are allowed to do delivery but not click and collect? That's crazy. Under level three, they will be able to do click and collect. Should have been able to do it weeks ago. And then there's this crazy case of a prisoner who got, re got remanded on bail outside the Auckland Alert Level 4 area. Now, here's the context. As a local MP, I get people all the time who for various reasons need an exemption. I worked for over a week to help an 83 and 85 year old couple get an exemption to move into their house that they had just settled on before the lockdown went into place. That elderly couple were living in a caravan and the Ministry of Health made an exemption only after I lobbied them for 10 days and finally did the right thing. The, the next case I've had is a kid who's stuck in alert level four doesn't get the additional NCEA credits because his school is in the Waikato, which is at alert level two. And so he has the worst of all worlds. Was he allowed to travel outside the Auckland alert level four area? No, he wasn't after several applications. I could go on. We've lobbied for all sorts of people, sometimes succeeding, sometimes not. But the cost to those people are real. To then find out that people who have committed a crime get remanded on bail by the authorities outside of the proper area. Well, outside of the area that no one else is allowed to leave, go to multiple places and apparently may have been spreading COVID is just outrageous. And the way I look at it, a lot of people thought if they crossed the border illegally, they'd get arrested. Who knew that if you got arrested, you'd be allowed to cross the border legally. But that's just the sort of madness that we're seeing in this government's COVID response. And that's why ACT is here to ask the right questions, to make constructive criticisms when necessary, and helpful suggestions when possible, because we just can't keep going on the way that this government is week by week with illogical rules, dividing people instead of uniting, failing to work with business to get better solutions, and costing the whole country and many businesses huge amounts of money every day. We just need a better way, and that's what we're here for. So that is today with Afghani translators, with COVID, and with <clears throat> illogical decisions and prisoners going across the border. But there was <clears throat> one small positive. I want to give a big shout out to the Bennetts who operate the Mr. Whippy trucks in the lower North Island. The Bennetts brought their Mr. Whippy truck along to Parliament and ended up, funnily enough, serving ice cream to those Afghani translators who helped the New Zealand Defence Force. 
they ended up part of the protest also for small business. And they talked about how they've had to adapt to start doing things differently to be able to keep serving ice cream under the alert level four rules. You can't help but admire the ingenuity, the agility, the flexibility, the resourcefulness and the initiative of small business owners who are up against it, but managed to react to the situation far more nimbly than anyone in government. So big ups to Mr. Whippy. Thanks for coming along, for giving us an ice cream, for letting me serve one, which I have to say is a lot harder than it looks to actually make that thing work. And there were some pretty wonky looking ice creams getting passed out of the truck, uh, but ice cream was the winner on the day. And it was really cool to share them with those Afghani translators. We've got a special guest on at TV tonight, and that is Karen Chua. Karen is an ACT MP and one of the bravest people I know for the story that she told on her first day in Parliament, her maiden statement. She told the story of being a SIPS or SIFS or Oranga Tamariki kid growing up. And she's someone who's come to Parliament having lived that experience, absolutely determined to change the system. And over the last year or so, I've watched her go from someone who was a small business owner herself someone who was engaged in the New Zealand-made clothing industry, making some fine pieces uh, for people to wear up and down New Zealand, to being increasingly knowledgeable about the laws and policy around what happens when someone has a kid in New Zealand and they don't want to or are unable to look after them or they're even abusive. Where does that kid go? How are they looked after? How do we avoid transferring them from pillar to post creating all sorts of anxieties and displacement as the system operates for its own purposes, but not for the purpose of that kid. I'm really proud to have brought Karen into Parliament as an ACT MP. I think she's going to go a very long way, and she's set to make some really positive change in this area of Oranga Tamariki. Karen, welcome back to ACT TV for your second tour of duty here. Great to have you. And um, how, how's Auckland? Do you, um, are you plotting an escape? Yeah, same four walls. You know, big family at home, so I think that helps a bit. But sometimes it can, it can, you can feel a bit claustrophobic in the house with six other people, but we're doing okay. All right. Well, we're, um, it's a real shame we've got to have our meetings with you on Zoom, but um, we can't wait till you can be released and uh, come down to Wellington and start asking some questions of this Minister for Children in the House. Um, so just to recap, because not everyone will have seen your story, it's been told in a few media and you told it in Parliament, uh, but just talk us through how you got engaged with what would have been SIPs then or SIFs, what's now mm. called Oranga Tamariki, and, and what sort of views you formed over it, about it. So, yeah, grow, growing up, um, my life was kind of a bit different from the very beginning. So um, I was brought to New Zealand by my mother when I was just a little baby, and I was left with my grandparents for the first five years of my life, and, and that was pretty good. A um, bit different, lived up north, but it was it was really stable in a loving environment. Um, when it came time for me to start school, uh, I went to live with my mother in Auckland and, and things kind of changed, you know, um, living with someone that didn't quite know how to parent um, and had also got into a new relationship and, and they were trying to work their own lives out um, without having a, a little child with them. And, and I think that created quite a hard scenario for them and for me. And things just, just um didn't really work out in that environment and as I got older um, life just was pretty tough and lots of people have it way tougher than I did but um, it got to the point where you know you, you kind of look at look at yourself and you think am I worth anything? Um, and at, am at I, this point you were about you know, nine years old? Nine or ten and just just you know looking at the world like um do I deserve to be here? Um, where do I belong and how do I fit in? And I remember being at about 10 thinking, you know, would it really matter if I didn't wake up tomorrow? And, and it was kind of, you know, it's really harsh when a 10-year-old is thinking that way and they don't have the support around them. And, and that was the first time that I had um, dealings with um, child, youth and family at that time. And, and I did, I cried out for help, but unfortunately um, the system the way it was then 
kind of didn't provide me with the help and the care that I needed and sent me straight back to, to where I'd run from. And, and, and because of that, my self-esteem was very low and I, and I wasn't a very um, confident person. And I was bullied a lot at school because of this, because I just, I just didn't want anybody to notice me. So I used to hide a lot and, and I was quite shy and that made me a target. So not only was home life not so great, school was actually just as bad so it got to the point where um, a lady that I didn't even know really um, kind of stepped in and said to me hey is everything all right something just doesn't seem right here and I, I said no it's not okay and that 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 woman fought for me she was my rock she took me to to um, child youth and family and the police and talked me through the process and supported me through that process. I don't know where I'd be today if if Donna had not done that for me. So it's about having, just finding the right support and finding the right person to stand behind you and actually tell you you are worth something. You do deserve to be in this world and you do have a purpose. And it makes a big difference. So that's that's probably a really good point to, to leap off and look at how the system works today because you had somebody who was an advocate that puts you at the centre of the system, that the actual child who the system's supposed to be set up to help. Um, it, but it seems that despite all the different attempts to reform it from SIPs to SIFs to Oranga Tamariki, um, a lot hasn't changed. That The fundamental problem is that a lot of kids don't have someone doing that. I, I sense that you're in Parliament to be that person for a whole lot of kids, uh, but through the political process. Why is it so hard to get Oranga Tamariki to be child-centred? It, it seems that this department started off with the best of intentions. So it, it, it's grown a lot over the years, and, and they've changed their values, and they've changed the way that they're doing things. But it seems that while they were growing, it's grown into this monster of legislation that's taken over. Um, and they've forgotten what the basics are. And that's the best interests of our kids. And seeing our kids as individual children, not this collective of every child is the same. Every child has different needs and, and different things that need to be taken care of. And if we just put our kids into these collective um, groups, we're not actually um, doing them any favours. We're actually skipping over what they need. We need to actually start listening and hearing what our children are saying. And, and I found that myself as a kid. Everybody was making the decisions around me. Everybody was talking over me. And everybody in these group discussions actually forgot to ask me how I felt about this and what I wanted to do going forward. And I think that was the most frustrating part for me, everybody making the decisions and not listening. So I know I know a, a lot of people come to you now because of the way you've told your story and you, you get people approaching you just about every day to, to try and help them through the system. Um, has it changed? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, it looked like they were going in the right direction. But then all of a sudden it was like the name changed and it was like it became it was no longer child youth and family it became ministry for vulnerable children which which to me was a nightmare i don't even know who decided to call it that because every child is vulnerable um but who also wants to walk into a building that where you're labeled as taking your ch vulnerable children in there it was just I, I can't understand the logic. So then they took away the vulnerable and, and it's now Ministry for Children or Oranga Tamariki. And constantly I hear that the failures that are going on and, and there seems to be so many failures at the moment. I mean, how do we have children being left in hospitals for weeks on end because there's nowhere to place them? That they, that they become so attached to the nurses within that hospital, they're kicking and screaming when, when we're trying to place them somewhere. The psychological damage that that does to kids, um, I cannot even understand. You know, children need love. They need an environment where they're cared for and they feel safe and secure. And a hospital bed when you're not sick, just because there's nowhere to put you, is, is not good enough. And well, we also it's a, it's a double failure, isn't it, for the yeah. healthcare system and for the care? Yeah. I mean, we, we're not exactly flush with hospital beds in this country, but yeah. uh, look, just just expanding it out a bit. I mean, I guess every you know humans have 
existed in some form for about 100,000 years, lived in caves and different types of civilizations and cultures all over the place. This, this basic problem of what happens when a kid is born, but their natural protectors and nurturers, their parents, either can't or won't look after them, or, or maybe even are abusive. Lots mm. of cultures have had to solve this problem. And it seems to me that for most of human history, most people have done this in a collective way, where you know it's a village to raise a child, a tribe raises a child. But that seems to have created um, some tension with the, the Western view of a nuclear family and you don't have, you know, multi-generational households and you don't live with all your uh, cousins the way that, you know, in, in a lot of cultures people still do um, and people, um, you know, have, have done for a lot of human history. It's that uh, this nuclear family is a, a relatively modern idea. Mm. Um, you know, and that seems to be playing out to some extent in a tension between Maori culture and Western culture in New Zealand, where the Maori worldview that at least some Maori are expressing is kids belong with the hapu, with the iwi, and, and it's wrong for the crown to take them away. Um, but there's another view, which I think is very valid, <laughs> which is that uh, it's not good enough to leave a kid in an unsafe situation uh, just to satisfy a, a cultural imperative. Um, what, what's your take, and, and you might want to talk about your bill a bit too, but what, what's your take on this tension between culture and safety that seems to be playing out at the moment with Oranga Tamariki policy? I, I don't think we have a, a good enough definition or, or them defining exactly what level they're going to tolerate before they step in when it comes to culture. So I've always thought that, you know, culture is important. Um, knowing knowing where we came from it can be quite empowering. But culture in a home and the way we love and care for each other, to me, is way more important than culture itself. We can learn our culture as we grow, which is what I, I've done as I've got older. But we can't get back those years where, uh, where we grow up with so many insecurities because we haven't had the, the, the right environment around us growing up. We're always told the first thousand days are just so important for, for our brains and the way we develop and, and how we grow up in the world. So surely we should be making sure that the first thousand days of every New Zealand child is the best that it can be. And if that means sometimes it's not with the same culture, but the culture within the house is better, I think that's the better option. I love that way that you turn that around and say, well, culture, you know, let, let's just focus first on the culture within the house, then the wider culture. Mm -hmm. So, and, and tell us about your, your bill. Now, you know, every ACT MP has a bill that's randomly selected if we're lucky to be debated. That's the, the perils of being an opposition party. You don't get to choose what, what's debated, but sometimes you get lucky and your bill gets picked out of the ballot. Um, you've got a bill in the ballot to be picked out, hopefully. Uh, what, what, what would happen if your bill was debated and passed? So my bill's in there. Is, it, it's a section of the um, Oranga Tamariki Act that specifically is based around culture. And I, I firmly believe that we should not have any race-based policies in New Zealand. Um, everybody should be treated as, as an equal in New Zealand. And the only way we're going to do that is if it's one the same laws for everyone and we treat everyone with the same values. And this section is encouraging um, social workers and the organisation to, to choose culture over what's in the best interests of the children. So unfortunately, that's not always possible. And we're finding that the consequences of this already uh, are becoming quite clear. And, and if we don't stop putting the ideology of only Māori can raise Māori, um, we're going to have major issues in the next few years. Um, and one of them I can see is, is a lack of loving homes for these kids because people will just stop putting their hands up uh, because they're getting chosen over the colour of their skin. Yeah. So surely one of the policy you know, goals should be to maximise the number of loving homes that are available for displaced kids. And you, you can't afford to discriminate if that's your goal. You've got to really make it attractive to, to give a, 
you know, a displaced kid, for want of a better term, a, a loving place to, to live where they're going to be physically safe, fed, educated, um, clothed and, and loved. I mean, that, that, that surely should be the goal. Um, and, and we're actually losing those opportunities by yeah. with these reverse uplifts where kids are taken out of a home. Um, what, how many places uh, can a kid end up by all these different placements that, that you have experienced? So there's actually no limit. So I personally know of people, like one person that, that has taken on a child that's under the age of 10 that has been in at least seven or eight homes, and all of those homes were family members. So it's not like they were put in strangers' homes. They were moved from one family member to another to another because each home was found to be unsuitable. And if, what does that do to a kid? I mean, your sense of self-worth and your ability to trust anyone. It stops them from, from putting their feet down and putting some roots down. They never trust that they're going to be there forever. And they never trust that the actual new family is going to love them for longer than a couple of months and then they're just going to move on. And so schooling, um, friendships, everything is affected. There's no stability in any area of their lives. So I am all for family first and let's have a look around and see if we can find family. But if that's not an option, then, then I think other cultures can give just as much love to a child. Yeah, I love what you say about the culture of the home. Um, we've got a few questions coming through. Nick asks, who is the Minister for Child Poverty? Uh, that would be Jacinda Ardern. Unbelievable. Child love, Poverty love, Reduction. Love and, love and kindness, and she's responsible for this. Um, Kerry says, as long as having children has a financial incentive for those on benefits, there will always be a strain on Oranga Tamariki. The welfare system and all the poor outcomes that come with it. Unfortunately, there aren't enough donors. I'm, I'm not. I, I, a donor was your person, right? Mm. Right. So, um, yes. Yeah. Well, that's a good question. I, I kind of am in two minds about that. You know, we talk about um, benefits and OT like like they go hand in hand, but unfortunately, abuse and neglect does not discriminate. It goes on in every household. It can go on in any household. So, so I I, I don't like to go down the road of of connecting benefits with OT because I know for a fact that it just doesn't discriminate. And we need to speak up no matter um, what kind of society we're living in, whether it be rich, poor or middle class, and work together as a nation instead of um, this divisive attitude of um, the poor are bad or the rich aren't, aren't going to hurt their children because it just doesn't discriminate. Yeah, look, we've got someone here who's made a question, uh, Elisa, says more money doesn't help if the philosophy is broken. And I don't mean, think we need to really answer that, but we, we couldn't agree more. Um, mm. This is about resourcefulness and initiative. Um, there's no point throwing money at, at broken systems. Uh, that just costs more money and gets the same result. Um, I'll just see if we've got any more questions here before we wrap up. This has been a great um, segment. Um, uh, Jennifer says, don't stop Act TV. Make it a weekly thing. Keep going. We need you. Okay, Jennifer, we, we will consider that. Um, Nadine says, children need love and stability. Removing child from a foster family and moving them to another is so wrong. Though, what they are wanting to do, this is breaking the cycle and giving kids a chance at a different life. Um, well, I think we, we, we'd agree with that. Um, we're actually almost right on 7.30. Um, so thank you very much, Nadine, Jennifer, Elisa, everyone who sent in comments, Nick. Um, but thank you, Karen. Is there any parting thought or, or comment that, um, you know, people really, if there's one thing people need to understand uh, to get on top of, of what, of, of the problems with Oranga Tamariki, is there one thing people don't get that maybe they do need to know? I, th I think the culture within OT needs to change a little bit. They need to be open to... Um, to the changes that have been coming their way. Um, and this has been going on for quite a while. And, and I think the whole culture of the whole organization needs a big shake up. But also we need to be stop treating OT like it's this miracle that's going to fix everything. And we need to also be concentrating on how those kids got there in the first place. Because there is a bit a little bit of personal responsibility with society to step up and make sure our children are safe. It's not just up to governments, it's up to us as a society to say enough is enough and we're not going to tolerate this anymore. 
And I think if we can work together as a nation, um, we can become a, a country we can all be proud of. Well, look, I'm not a God-fearing man, but amen to that. Uh, thank you very much, Karen. That has been a really excellent chat. And uh, I'm sure people watching will agree that uh, we've just seen the Minister for Children that New Zealand's children actually need rather than the ones that the Wellington bureaucracy has been happy to have uh, for too many years now. Uh, like I say, that's our second to last night of ACT TV. Uh, we'll be joining you for a final wrap as Auckland leaves Alert Level 4 tomorrow night. We will have had a day of Parliament. Uh, we can't wait to join you and we hope that everybody is staying safe and making the most of their time on Earth tonight. Good night. <laughs>